Do you guys think we will ever be free of Dr. Fauci? I'm watching him in these House hearings now in front of Congress, and I'm just feeling like I've been with this man for a thousand years. He's been there my whole life. There was never a time when Dr. Fauci was not at the center of public life, and I am so sick of this guy's stupid face. You know what the Dr. Fauci hearings really make me think of? Because I have to tell you, I'm not usually a cynical person. I'm somebody that wants to believe in hope and wants to think about how we can work to make things better. But I, I have almost no hope that these hearings will bring out anything conclusive about Dr. Fauci's role in COVID. I just think people have already made their decisions about that. Fauci's going to go to his grave denying that he covered up the research into the origins of COVID, that he lied about why masks were necessary and how many masks were necessary, that he lied about lying. I mean, these things are known to those that know such things and look into them. They are studiously denied by Fauci and his acolytes. And I think we've all just kind of dug in on this. I, I doubt very much that we're going to have the reckoning that some of us long for. But it's still kind of an interesting experience to be reacquainted with Dr. Fauci at this moment in the news, because what it really makes me think about is how did this putz, this little guy, turn into the world's priest for years, it felt like. There was a time when what Dr. Fauci said was the closest thing we had in our culture to the pronouncements of the Pope. Like, if you think about what it would have been like to live in the medieval era, an announcement comes down ex cathedra, if the Pope said, we're all wearing funny hats on Wednesdays now, you have to do it. That was simply the voice of absolute truth. That's kind of what Fauci was like for a lot of people for a long time. And this era in our history, this moment in our public history, has disappeared into a kind of a haze, a dreamlike haze, as if it's something we all just slept through. And I feel this way too, even though I was really involved in the news and watching everything very closely when COVID hit and lived through it all. I was there. I saw the great sagas of the COVID wars of 2020. Even so, to me, it just feels like a dream. And I think part of this is on purpose. I think we want to forget about that episode because we all behaved shamefully in different ways. And this is true whatever side of the political spectrum you're on. It was a totally unsettling event, unprecedented, something none of us had ever quite lived through before. And we all made mistakes. Some of us, I think, made worse mistakes than others. But all of us zigged when we should have zagged, freaked out when we should have remained calm. Uh, there were political shifts going on that were happening in real time, and everybody was trying to kind of catch up to. And I look back on that time with this real kind of confusion and a, a sense of just dreamlike uncertainty. But the question that remains for me is, suddenly it was revealed that the doctors and the scientists and the public health officials had become our clerisy. And I think that took a lot of people by surprise that we were living in a world where the science, capital S, was the closest thing we had to a state-approved faith that kind of counted as the backdrop of absolute truth. And we were seeing all sorts of crazy things, like people were lighting prayer candles to Dr. Fauci. There were church services given in his honor. Really, like, end times level stuff. And... That's a part of it that even if we never get a political reckoning over this, that part of it deserves further reflection and sort of retrospection because I actually think it reveals something really profound about the moment that we're at in history. And I, I have kind of a take on this. I have an answer to why Dr. Fauci became our priest, why science or the science or this idea we have about science kind of stepped in to fill the void that had been left in society as the church receded from the center of our life. And so surprising absolutely nobody, the take that I have to give you on this goes back 
to the ancient world. And I would like in the next couple episodes of Young Heretics to tell you a story about how science took its place at the center of our public life. And it's a story that begins with a fella called Euhemerus. He's a bit of a backbencher, at least he is now. If you've heard of him, that's extra credit. You get brownie points. If you've never heard of him, this guy is the author of the most controversial travel blog in history. He's like, if you've ever read like one of those books by somebody that's just wandering around telling you about the things I saw in France. Euhemerus is a little bit like that, except that his book causes a centuries-long explosion of controversy, because what he ends up writing about, what Euhemerus ends up sort of leading people to believe is that the Greek gods, the pagan gods of antiquity, and actually not just the Greek gods, but that these same gods were thought to be the gods worshipped by the Romans and even the Egyptians, there was kind of a general idea that the gods were the same everywhere, and so even though men gave them different names, these weren't separate pantheons, these were different cultural ways of describing the same theological reality. What Euhemerus insinuated is that those gods weren't actually divine entities. They weren't supernatural beings that men had encountered throughout time and space, but they were basically mythologized versions of normal human people, that there were these great men throughout history with names like Jupiter or Zeus and Uranus or what have you. And they did astonishing things, like, for example, they charted out the heavens, or Zeus was a great king who lived on Earth and then died... And in the honor that they were afforded by posterity, that men remembered them with this great honor, these people eventually came to be known as gods, or even to give their names to certain planets and certain institutions so that they took on this outsized uh, kind of position in, in human memory. And as we'll see, Euhemerus didn't actually plunk for that idea exactly, but that's what his name came to be associated with. And he gave his name to a whole philosophy called Euhemerism. And there is an interesting journey that we can take from this ancient idea of Euhemerism to this modern idea of science as a religion or science as a faith. So that's the story I want to tell you. Um, we get Euhemerus. Euhemerus comes down to us from another author, Diodorus Siculus. Now, Diodorus, he's called Siculus, that means the Sicilian, because he was born in Sicily. And he writes this enormous doorstopper of a history. It's called the Library of History. Used to be a bestseller, used to be really well known in the Renaissance, in the early modern period, was an important source. Not so much anymore, kind of got elbowed out of the way by Herodotus and Thucydides, but still an important source for a lot of what we know, and is written around the 30s BC, maybe a little earlier, maybe like 60s to 30s BC, so right before kind of the high imperial period leading into the Augustan age, this guy sets down a massive history of the world, starting with the fall of Troy, which is kind of a classic place to start, and gives us this magisterial story about all of human life and politics up to his own day or thereabouts. Um, and we have only a fragment of the book, book six, in which Diodorus talks about Euhemerus. Now, side note, here's a little pro tip. Whenever you hear that we have a fragment of something, what that means is that it, some portion of a work has been preserved, usually by some other author. I think when people say fragment, we have a fragment of Diodorus, we have a fragment of Euhemerus or whoever... Uh, I, at least, used to picture, when I was growing up, I used to picture, like, little scraps of parchment, essentially. And sometimes that happens, like, you dig up a big scrap heap or a trash heap at Oxyrhynchus or wherever, and you do get, like, oh, on the back of this receipt, it looks like somebody wrote down half of Aristotle's Symposium or whatever. And and that, that did happen, the way that scrap paper was used in antiquity. You do sometimes get actual physical fragments. But usually that word fragment just means, like, this text was quoted from somewhere. And here's my pro tip. 
whenever you come across something that you're interested in that's written in a fragment, go find where that fragment comes from, where it's written down. Because scholars have this annoying habit of talking about the most insane things in the most boring ways. And some of this is just kind of expediency, you're working fast, you need a technical language for talking about things. But it's also because scholars have no sense of adventure or fun. Like you, you tend to kind of lose out on the sense of the majesty, the magic of stuff as you get more and more into the weeds and into the details, which is one reason why sometimes professional scholars are actually the worst people for talking about literature, even though they know the most. G.K. Chesterton says, unless you kick your feet with delight when you hear uh, the story of uh, the cow jumping over the moon, then you're not qualified to talk about it because that's the whole point of the story is the just the insane wonderful wild ways that human beings experience life and so this word fragment kind of hides over these insane twisting rabbit warrens these these journeys that texts take as they come down the centuries to us and sometimes half of good scholarship is just developing a knack for reading some dry dusty work uh, by some German or something, and he's going along and he's talking in this perfectly matter-of-fact way, and then you have to have the knack for just saying to the German guy, wait a second, what? Like, he said what? Because he'll they'll pass over this stuff, and then you can, you can kind of blink and miss it if you're starting to snooze, but sometimes it'll be like, you know, yes, and Immanuel Kant, like, had a theory of the beginning of the universe that was a precursor to the Big Bang, and moving on, like, here's this other thing, and you have to sort of gain, I think, the courage and also the habit of just saying, hold up, whoa, 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 what, like, Kant figured out the Big Bang? And the answer is, like, kind of, yeah, in, a, in, like, a primary or primeval way, a little bit. And there's just a bananas bonkers stuff hiding away in this, uh, in, in, in these kind of uh, 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 dry scholarly words. And this is an example of this. So here we have this fragment of Diodorus Siculus. And you can find it in, in editions of the Library of History, this, you know, ancient history, here's everything we have of it, here's a fragment of Book 6. And you'll get it without any note about, like, where it comes from or what, what kind of fragment it is. But it turns out that this particular portion of Book 6 is preserved by one of the church fathers, this guy called Eusebius of Caesarea. And Caesarea or Caesarea is the capital of the Roman province of Judea. So now where the modern state of Israel is on the coast. And uh, Eusebius is a third century AD church father, a Christian, who writes, among other things, a bunch of stuff, but he, he writes something called Preparations for the Gospel. And that name, which is a great title, indicates that what Eusebius is trying to do is he's trying to get pagans ready to read the Bible, which if you think about it is kind of an amazing task for him to have because he's living in a world that is still basically dominated by these pagan gods. And he's saying, all right, I need to tell you about Jesus. But Jesus only makes sense really to Jews. Like, Jews at least can understand whether they agree or not what it means that Jesus was the Messiah. If you say, like, to a Jewish synagogue, the Messiah that is talked about in our holy books is this guy named Jesus, that's at least an intelligible sentence. But if you tell a pagan this, it's a little bit like saying Thanos secretly slept with the Red Witch. And if you followed the entire story of the Avengers and all of that, like, you, you might feel that this is a mind-blowing revelation. Like, what? Like, where did that happen? What are you talking about? But you have to know the entire lore of the fictional universe in order to get what's going on here. Or if somebody said to you, like, in the Silmarillion, there's a secret Easter egg that explains why Gollum does what he does with the ring or whatever. Like, there's, there's this huge kind of context behind the statement that Jesus is the Messiah that somebody like Eusebius has to kind of ease his readers into all of this backstory, all of this history. And that's what the preparations for the gospel is. It's like an introduction to the necessary concepts for a pagan to understand what 
the Christian message even is and means and why it is relevant at all. And in order to do this, he has to kind of meet the pagans where they are, including talking about Greek philosophy, talking about the worship of the various gods, and showing why all of this stuff, even if it makes a certain degree of sense, is missing something. It doesn't quite get at the whole of reality. And this is a mode of argumentation that we've talked about a lot on this show, because I'm always stressing that paganism and uh, the Greek and Roman world and Greek and Roman philosophy isn't Christian. There are certain elements of Christianity that are totally missing, but it's also not completely insane. Like, people weren't stupid or crazy for every period of history before the coming of Jesus, and we do have reason, and we are able to look at the world and understand some amount of it, and Christians can readily understand that this is because God creates us in his image, we have reason, and even if that image is distorted by sin, we're still able to look, do things like notice that, hmm, the same stars seem to show up in the same place all the time, like, wonder why that is, you know? And Eusebius is basically saying, okay, you've seen some things about the world, you've understood some things, but you've also made a bunch of mistakes, like, which, understandable, now Christianity is is here to correct them. And one of the mistakes he wants to talk about is that you've looked at the patterns of the natural world, you've looked at the way things tend to work, the fact that you're living in a creation that seems governed by reason, and you've somewhat understandably inferred from this that there are divine powers, supernatural entities, minds, that are ruling over certain domains of this creation. Like, there's certain people in charge of certain neighborhoods in the ordered universe. And if you think about it, like, we can make fun of this as some kind of primitive caveman way of thinking, except it's actually a lot more reasonable than, like, atheism. Atheism is the idea that nothing suddenly gave birth to something, and that something had all the appearance of having been constructed by a thoughtful mind, and yet wasn't, right? That's kind of how atheism works. Paganism is much more sensible than atheism. Paganism says, look look around you, the world seems to give evidence of some kind of plan. It's a bigger plan than any human being could possibly have worked out, and we don't have control over this stuff. So there must be some other mind, like ours, but greater and more powerful, that's at work. And since various different domains of creation seem to have various different forms of logic operating within them, there must be different powers in charge of different things, right? This is a natural human way of looking at the world, and in fact, it's the way that basically everybody looked at the world all the time, which is one reason why, in fact, the gods do look the same in, in similar cultures. So here's Eusebius, and he has to come along and meet these people who say, well, my description of things seems perfectly accurate and normal and rational, and why wouldn't I just believe in these gods that are in charge of the natural world? And Eusebius has to say, yeah, I see how it could look that way, but actually, this is appearances can be a little bit deceiving, and you've only got a portion of the picture. And this is why it's in Eusebius, and it's important that it's in Eusebius, that we get the hit portion of Diodorus Siculus that tells us about Euhemerus. Because Euhemerus is a very useful person for Eusebius to talk about when he's trying to show the pagans that they haven't got it quite right about the gods. He's saying, yes, everybody throughout most of time has thought that there were these divine supernatural entities that were running the world, but this is a common mistake because what was actually going on here is something relatively natural, right? This was just the world as, you know, basically natural science is able to describe it, but it's been embellished by the poets, and it's been kind of embroidered by the tall tales of history, and your own philosophers, some of your own journeymen, have found out that actually underneath all of these myths and all of these stories, there's really a perfectly rational, natural explanation. So here is what Diodorus reports about Euhemerus. He says, with regard then to gods, the men of old have handed down to their posterity two sets of notions, 
For some, they say, are eternal and imperishable, as the sun and moon and the other heavenly bodies, and besides these the winds, and the rest who partake of the like nature with them. For each of these has an eternal origin and eternal continuance. Other deities, they say, were of the earth, but because of the benefits which they conferred on mankind, they have received immortal honor and glory, as Heracles, Dionysus, Aristeus, and others like him. And Diodorus goes on to tell the story of how Euhemerus, at the request of the king of Macedon, this is right after Alexander dies, and so one of his heirs in Macedon sends Euhemerus out on this basically vacation or like backpacking trip through the Mediterranean world where he writes the world's most controversial travel blog, which is called The Sacred Histories and which reports such things as tombs that are erected in certain places to the individuals that would eventually become commemorated and known as gods. And this idea, which is called Euhemerism, sort of floats around in the water throughout the Hellenistic era and the last centuries of the pagan world. And it's kind of a late-stage idea. It's the sort of thing that you would come up with or start to suspect after many, many centuries of believing in these gods, but also having some doubts that they really do exist, right? So it's 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 like a postmodernist kind of idea about the gods that Euhemerus floats, that Diodorus brings up. You also get it, like, in Callimachus, who's this very impish, kind of cheeky poet from the library, who, who works as the librarian of Alexandria. Um, but it's always in the pagan world kind of too clever by half. It's like a idea for, for intellectuals and debunkers who like to explain things away. The most people, I would wager, during this time, if they're not Jews or Christians, are going to go on believing that the pagan gods are really real. It seems like the most obvious way of accounting for all of this stuff, right? If you're just your average, whatever, goat farmer out in on the Greek islands, and somebody comes along to you and says, like, the Greek gods are actually just de deified heroes, and it's a perfectly natural explanation, well, you're likely to say, I don't know, man, like, the rains come, and I don't know where they come from, so it seems to make sense that they're coming from Olympus or whatever, um, you're probably going to persist in your just normal pagan belief. But philosophers have always had this kind of troublemaking impulse to um, raise uncomfortable questions, just like Socrates did, about whether it really makes sense to believe that there are all these different gods at work. And so Euhemerus offers one explanation for why it might look like there are a bunch of gods at work, but actually uh, just people, just very extraordinary men who happened to observe the motions of the heavens and then gradually became remembered as lords of the motions of the heavens. So, back to Eusebius. Why is he bringing all of this up? And this is why you always need to check where the fragment comes from. Well, after Christianity, when Christianity starts to make its way out into the pagan world, which it does in a way that Judaism did not, right? Judaism is, is much less interested in proselytism, in preaching to other people and trying to convert them to to the Jewish faith. Um, Christianity, go and make disciples of all nations, right? You've got a task, which means you do have to go out into these, this pagan world and explain to them why they should care about some preacher that got killed by the Roman state and by his own people. Why do we care? Why does it matter, right? Um, and the answer has to do with the fact that there's a better explanation for your experience of the world than the pagan gods. Yes, there are all these problems with the pagan gods. Also, they cause you to do nasty things like sacrifice, and this is probably an, an issue. It doesn't seem to work so well when you pray for the rains and they don't come. What do you believe about that? Like all these questions that are kind of lingering and have been poked at by the philosophers now come front and center because the Christians want to say that they have a better explanation for all of this. And that is when Euhemerus suddenly has his day, suddenly starts to become way more popular and important, is among the church fathers, especially of the 200s and 300s AD. So Eusebius is not the only one who starts to dig this stuff back up. You also get it in the divine institutes of a guy called Lactentius, who also lives between around 250-ish to 325-ish. And in the divine institutes, 
Lactantius writes again about this kind of euhemerist idea. And he says something which he picks up, I think, from the Greek philosophers and which was very popular to believe among the intellectuals. He says, nothing is wholly invented by the poets. Something perhaps is transferred and obscured by oblique fashioning under which the truth was enwrapped and concealed. And this is a, a common idea that the poets and the philosophers have this knowledge that's so dangerous and explosive that they would probably be killed, like Socrates, if they really came right out and said, the gods aren't real, the gods are just people, the gods are just natural phenomena, whatever. And so they have to kind of cloak it in these illusions and myths and allegories. Um, they say, says Lactantius, that heaven fell to the share of Jupiter, the sea to Neptune, and the infernal regions to Pluto. Why was not the earth rather taken as the third portion, except that the transaction took place on earth? That is so sly. You've got to hand it to him. This is like a very coy form of argumentation that a pagan would be likely to receive with some interest because it plays the same game as all of the philosophers do of making these clever little syllogisms or even, you might say, sophistries. Um, Therefore, it is true that they so divided and portioned out the government of the world that the empire of the east fell to Jupiter. A part of the west was allotted to Pluto, who had the surname of Agesilaus, because the region of the east from which light is given to mortals seems to be higher, but the region of the west lower. So they veiled a truth under a fiction that the truth itself detracted nothing from public persuasion. He's saying this is a description, this is obviously an account of a human political deal that was made to divide up the territories of the world between these ancient kings. Gradually, the kings were deified, they were remembered as gods, but really, ultimately, it was just a kind of a form of myth-making. The poets presented it this way to please the masses, but they also handed down the truth, which can now be excavated by Christianity, because we know that the real god isn't a man, isn't a, at least a human, merely human man on, on earth. He has a much more complicated relationship to humanity, and he rules over all things. He's not competing with various different other gods. He's actually in charge of them all. Origen, in his uh, famous book Contra Celsum, in which he sort of contradicts the attack on Christianity that had been raised by this pagan philosopher named Celsus, again sort of broaches the subject. And what's really interesting here is that Celsus has clearly mounted an attack against this ascendant young upstart religion called Christianity. And one of the attacks he's made is that Christianity is just another kind of euhemerist story. It's like this guy, Jesus, was on earth, he was a physical human man, and now you're trying to claim that he was God. And if he was he's God, then why not all these other people that we've seen at work in the world, like Asclepius, for, for example. And and here's what uh, Origen, the church father, Origen, although it depends whether you accept him as a church father or not, what you think of the controversies that surrounded him, but let's call him a church father, Origen, says, This jester Celsus, omitting no species of mockery and ridicule which can be employed against us, mentions in his treatise the Dioscuri and Hercules and Asclepius and Dionysus, who are believed by the Greeks to have become gods after being men and says that we cannot bear to call such beings gods because they were at first men, and yet they manifested many noble qualities which were displayed for the benefits of mankind, while we assert that Jesus was seen after his death by his own followers, and he brings against us an additional charge as if we said that he was seen indeed but was only a shadow. So this is this amazing, like, humorist battle going on between the pagans and, and the Christians, in which Kelsa says actually that these human beings did become gods, that they were deified for real, and now you want to introduce another one into the pantheon, but your evidence for this is much shakier and shadier than the, the evidence of all these other guys that really did exist, you humorist tells us, and then have entered into the pantheon of heaven. So you can see there's various different options here. You can say, the gods are real, but they were once human beings. You can say the gods weren't real at all. They were always just human beings. Or you can say the gods were intimations, suggestions in human life 
of a God who would eventually come and live out the truth of things, who was Jesus. And this is going to gradually become kind of the Christian option. Is the, the Christian response is, the gods were probably just people. We made these myths about them, but the myths weren't pulled out of nowhere. They were a response to our sense that there's more than just humanity in the world. And so we've confused these two true ideas. One of them is that people do extraordinary things and the human mind is a, is a great wonder. The other is that there's something in the world that is greater than us, which we can see if just you drop a rock on the ground. You can see that there's some force or power pulling it to the ground that controls it that you can't stop. And so we've combined these two things by accident and or by poetic design and said that it was these great human beings who are actually in control of the powers that run the world. And Origen and Lactantius and Eusebius and all these church fathers are basically working their way to an argument that that doesn't make any sense, that these two ideas have to be separated from one another. You've got to put God in one bucket and incredible human beings in another bucket. So, okay, fair is fair. This is the Christian answer. It's interesting that it starts to emerge around the third and fourth centuries AD, because you're like, wow, this really looks like Christianity kind of on the offensive. This looks like the Christians are starting to gather ahead of steam and become extra confident in their arguments against paganism. And you wonder, like, why might that be? What else happened in the 300s AD? Open my almanac. Oh, right, like Constantine converts in 312 AD. And this is the high noon, really, of the Christian takeover of the pagan world. So it makes perfect historical sense that Euhemerus, who is a pagan, is going to get a revival in the 300s when the Christians need a good answer to the question, why does it look like there are all these gods around? And it really is a question that needs an answer because the gods seem to be kind of a perennial human constant. You get, for example, in all these different cultures, the idea of certain kinds of gods that come back again and again, you always have a king figure. You've always got somebody like Marduk or Zeus or Amon in the Egyptian pantheon or Ashur in the Assyrian pantheon. You've always got, say, a goddess of love or sex, right? You've got Ishtar and Venus and Aphrodite and Hathor, right? And all of these different cultural names for what seems like kind of the same entity. And one way of explaining that, kind of the most obvious pagan way of explaining that would be like, yeah, because the gods are real. And so men throughout time have met them and have encountered these forces in the world. And they've come away with basically the same description of things. And the Christian response to that is, it's true that these people were experiencing realities in the world, but they've totally misinterpreted what that what those realities were. These people were just people. They weren't in charge of the natural world. God is is real, is, is, is a real God, but has only been embodied one time on earth in, in the person of Jesus. But notice that this strategery, this maneuvering of the Christians against the pagans, ends you up with like a kind of gap. And the gap is, what do we do with the natural world? What do we do with the fact that the world looks designed and controlled by a mind that is more than human? Because it can't, if, if it's really true that these other entities were just human beings, that Zeus was just a great king that was then memorialized as a god, and Aphrodite maybe was just a very beautiful woman or whatever, if that's the case, then they can't have been in control of things like the rising of the sun because the rising of the sun happened before Zeus, the man, lived and died. And so there's got to be some other explanation for why the world looks designed. And of course, the Christian answer is going to be, yeah, of course, God made it, right? Here's Genesis 1. This is where the pagan, or rather the Christian apologists, have expertly created a gap into which they can insert Genesis 1, and, and indeed John 1, and the whole account that there was a divine mind that orchestrated all of this, but there was only one of them, and his, his embodiment is known in the person of Jesus Christ, and in no other mythological story. So 
all of the natural forces that we see in the world, even though they are the product of something greater than us, are not the product of individual gods that are sort of competing. Which is why it's very interesting and very helpful, I should think, for the Christian apologists that Diodorus, when he's introducing Euhemerus, actually tells us something interesting about the strategy that Euhemerus used. He says, okay, so one way of accounting for the gods is just to say that they were these, you know, human beings. But there's another way of accounting for them. Remember when I read this portion from the uh, Library of History, right? The men of old have handed down two sets of notions. For some gods are eternal and imperishable, such as the sun and the moon and other heavenly bodies. And besides these, the winds and the rest which partake of the like nature with them. So already in antiquity, alongside the humorist idea, there was this idea that the gods are actually just names, mythological names for natural phenomena, physical objects and the way that they behave in the world. And now the Christians can basically come along and say exactly what you were observing was, on the one hand, human activity, and on the other hand, the natural world, which is governed by a divine mind, but which isn't itself composed of divine minds. And so the sun does move according to patterns that seem rational, and that's because it was placed there by a rational mind, but not because the sun itself is a god. Similarly, the moon and the wind and the stars and all of these natural forces, natural entities, do have a cosmic design. They do have a intention behind them, but they are not, in fact, divine creatures themselves. They're not divine beings. Fast forward many, many hundreds of years. Christendom happens. The conversion of Constantine and all these arguments, all the, all the hashtag work that was done by Eusebius and Lactantius and Origen and these kinds of guys that were sort of conquering the pagan world with the truths of Christianity, eventually give you a universe in which Europe is Christian. And it's in that context that, as I have been recently talking about, the Christian world starts to look back on the pagan world and think about maybe giving it a reboot or a reskin because, well, a bunch of reasons, but medieval Christianity kind of gets exhausted, needs new sources of inspiration. Around about the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, you're going to start to get stirrings of this idea that, okay, so we've now canceled all the pagan gods. The pagan gods are canceled. They don't exist. But, the pagan ideas about the world that the myths about the gods expressed aren't necessarily all bad ideas. So, no more gods, but what were the truths that pagans knew that they were expressing through their myths, and maybe even willingly and intentionally concealing within these mythological allegories? And it turns out there was kind of a lot of good stuff that we maybe missed when we just got rid of paganism altogether and... That, my friends, is called the Renaissance. So now you've got the Renaissance. You're rebooting the pagan world. But you have to make sure that you don't bring the old gods back. And there's less of a danger of that now than there was, say, in Eusebius' day. But it's still not totally guaranteed that you're going to just, like, seamlessly transition from Christianity with no paganism to Christianity with paganism kind of active within it. And so suddenly, in the 1600s, as this effort is really grinding, really getting underway, you're going to have the return of euhemerism to the world and the return of the idea that Greek myths are just really kind of literary or artistic or allegorical portrayals of the natural world. And what's bananas about this is that there's a direct line for exactly this reason from Euhemerus and Diodorus and Eusebius on straight through to the architects of the scientific revolution, including Isaac Newton, who comes up in a setting in the sort of Oxford-Cambridge world of the 1600s, where people are starting to get really, really interested in euhemerus and in descriptions and explanations, natural explanations for the pagan mythologies. And, th and this idea starts to emerge. It's called the Prisca Theologia. 
which is Latin for kind of the original or the pristine theology, the first theology, which is this natural theology that, as I've now been saying for this whole episode, is kind of in evidence everywhere throughout the cultures of the world, that people do, as they look out at the world, tend to populate it with a cast of characters and and describe the world in, in these theological terms. And the Renaissance thinkers and the architects of the scientific revolution have to come up with a way of explaining why these guys who were so incredibly smart about the natural world also had all these myths about gods. And Euhemerus is a great way of doing that. And the Prisca Theologia is basically a code word for saying people had the right idea about theology. And in fact, mankind naturally has a relationship to God and to his creation and to understanding how God orders his creation. But demons and sin and all of the evil that there is in the world causes this original theology to get corrupted and distorted and transformed into the lies of the pagans and the myths about Zeus and Leda and the swan and all these weird, sordid stories that they get told. And this is where Isaac Newton starts to dabble in euhemerism because he says, okay, there was this Prisca Theologia I, he gets it, I think, probably from this guy Ralph Cudworth and a few others that sort of move in the Cambridge circles. They're sometimes called the Cambridge Platonists. And Newton starts to write about the idea that Greek gods and Greek myths are just like cryptic histories of the corruption of the original theology. And we get this work that Newton kind of scribbles out and, and thinks about and works on called the Philosophical Origins of Pagan Theology in the 1680s, Theologiae Gentilis Origines Philosophiae. And in this text and in the notes that he makes for, for this work, Newton starts to develop the idea that the Greek gods are actually just the sons of Noah. And why would the sons of Noah be his candidates for the real OG Zeus and Osiris and, and so on and so forth? Well, there's a good answer for this, right? Noah is the character in Genesis who starts the world afresh. And so anything that we now live with has to ultimately be traced back to a history that begins with Noah. Because God wipes the slate clean, you know, kills everybody, basically, in the flood, except for Noah. And then Noah has his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it's from that original family unit that all the peoples of the world are basically generated in, in Genesis. And you may remember the story, Noah, obviously a righteous man, builds the ark, we, we love him, yay Noah, uh, Shem and Japheth, also pretty decent blokes, right? We're happy with Shem and, and Japheth. Ham, not so much. Ham is the problem child because when Noah gets drunk and leaves himself uncovered, it's Ham who looks on his father's nakedness. There's all sorts of incredibly dark uh, suggestions about what that might mean. But uh, Shem and Japheth protect Noah from this terrible enormity from, from this disgrace that, that Ham works upon him. And from then on, Ham is why we can't have nice things, right? Ham is the problem. It's him. Hi. Ham's the problem. Um, and the reason for this is because obviously he's very evil. He did the, the bad thing and Shem and Japheth did the good thing. And so anything bad is ultimately has to be traced back to Ham. And this is where we get the idea that Ham, whose descendants include the original Egyptians, starts to corrupt the Prisca Theologia, starts to tell lies and stories and myths about what the original theology was, was really like. Um, and this fits perfectly because Egypt is thought in the ancient world as well as in the modern world to be the source of a lot of pagan theology. The Egyptians are the oldest civilization that kind of Plato has contact with, right? Plato represents them as these ancient sages when the Greek sages like Thales were just in their youth and Greek civilization was just in its youth. But the Egyptians carry this deep ancestral memory. And for Newton, what that means is they are the source via Ham of all the corruptions that eventually distort the mankind's original true knowledge of the natural world and of the gods and of God. 
which then comes down kind of in this distorted way, but now is being uncovered and, and recovered. And this is a very fitting way for people at, in the 1600s to kind of look at pagan mythology because with the birth of what's going to become like Enlightenment rationalism, people like Newton and those around him are starting to think that there there must be truths that can be known through the mind alone, through the human reason that we have to explore and experience the world. And this is the impulse that gives rise to science. And it's also the impulse that leads people to suspect that there are certain moral principles that everybody believes. Ultimately, that same idea is going to give you things like the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, not that everybody everywhere knows them, but that they are of a nature to be discerned by human reason. Human reason is equipped to know these basic moral truths. And that idea is starting to get off the ground here, and there's a major challenge that that idea has to answer, which is why does everybody get these so wrong if they're so self-evident? Sin is the classic answer, the distortion of human reason. And that story is perfectly fitted, suited to give rise to or to revive the idea of euhemerism. And so you start to see this everywhere. You start to see everywhere the idea that there was an original theology or that people have this basic intuition of basic of God and the natural world kind of ruled over by God, but that there's always this falling away at some point, whether it was under the reign of the Egyptians or what. Um, and it shows up, for example, in Paradise Lost, right? 1667, this, this poem is first published. We get this giant catalog of all the demons who fall from heaven. And Milton goes on to say that these demons are going to trick mankind into believing that they are actually gods. And for example, here's line 476 of the Milton's Paradise Lost Book 1, right? After these, after these other demons, appeared a crew who, under names of old renown, Osiris, Isis, Horus, and their train, with monster shapes and sorceries, abused fanatic Egypt and her priests to seek their wandering gods disguised in brutish forms rather than human. Nor did Israel escape the infection when their borrowed gold composed the calf in Oreb. So even the golden calf, right, this is right after they've left Egypt, this is an infection of demonic activity that distorts the true vision of humanity's kind of natural relationship to God. Why does any of this have anything to do with Anthony Fauci? Well, I'm going to leave you with the following thought. If euhemerism is true, and if the architects of the scientific revolution were right that the pagan myths are sort of half-truths or misunderstandings of human history and of mankind's relationship to God, then it follows that the information that the pagans knew about the natural world and natural science was also encoded into their myths. And this is where that Diodorus passage becomes really important, where the idea resurfaces that these Greek philosophers and these pagan, you know, just thinkers, basically, were looking at the natural world, discerning its logic and its order, and rightly observing that the world is ordered and hangs together in this cosmic way, but falsely attributing that to the action of the gods. And so now we've taken the gods away, we've stripped the gods away, we've made it impossible to believe in them, but we still believe in the rationally ordered universe now because it was God on, on high, the, the true God who designed that universe. And so you start to get at exactly this same time the recovery of the idea that Science is also just revealing the secret meanings of the Greek myths. And somebody who's very into this idea is none other than Francis Bacon, often known as the forefather of the scientific method in the court of King James, right, doing amazing things with epistemology and the philosophy as well as with what will become modern science. And in 1609, he writes this book, On the Wisdom of the Ancients, in which he basically argues everything that I've just been suggesting to you, that the pagan gods are just anthropomorphized, anthropomorphized personified versions of the real entities that science describes. And th this book, which was vastly popular, huge bestseller, On the Wisdom of the Ancients, Bacon writes all these little essays about different 
characters from Greek mythology and says these are actually just allegorical names for real physical entities in the natural world. And Bacon says, for example, that Cupid, that is the little boy god of love, is actually just an allegory for none other than the atom. Here's, here's what he writes. He says, The particulars related by the poets of Cupid, or love, do not properly agree to the same person, yet they differ only so far that if the confusion of persons be rejected, the correspondence may hold. They say that love was the most ancient of all the gods and existed before everything else except chaos. This fable points at and enters the cradle of nature. Love seems to be the appetite or incentive of the primitive matter, or, to speak more distinctly, the natural motion or moving principle of the original corpuscles or atoms. Now, corpuscle is just a coinage that means little body, and it's the old word for atoms. And it's at this point that people are starting to believe in what comes to be known as the mechanical philosophy, which depends on this solid idea of atoms, which is often kind of attributed to Democritus or Epicurus, right, that we have these little objects moving around in the world, and they create everything that we see and experience. And the reality of things is the hard, fast truth of these quantifiable, measurable objects. And because these objects were suspected or known about in antiquity, they were mythologized into beings like Cupid because if the atoms have attractive powers, properties that force them to move in certain ways, those powers were explained as a kind of desire of love. And so from the beginning of the scientific revolution, science and the description of the natural world became a kind of clearinghouse where all the old gods could be repositioned, could be relocated. You say the pagan myths were false, but they were intimations of something true. And so our sense that the world is peopled by these foreign powers is going to get relocated and neutralized in natural science. It's a kind of catch and kill strategy for the myths of the pagan world. And science, therefore, becomes invested with the responsibility of describing all the things that the pagan myths used to describe. This is a perfectly reasonable thing to say if you believe that the god, the real god, is somewhere else, outside of nature, speaking into nature through time, but not himself contained within the sun or the moon. And this is how you end up with, basically, science in Christendom. You end up with this idea that God is sovereign over the divine realm, and yes, there is a divine realm, and our sense that there's a divine realm is not crazy or made up, but... There is also this physical realm that has sometimes been confused with the divine realm and has all of these powers that look divine but are actually perfectly rational and understandable and can be described through experiment and through, through science. Now the twist, the punchline. If you've got God to explain why people believe in the supernatural, then you can say that these pagan entities which now live in science are just myths, are just fantasies or, or illusions. And really what's going on here is a perfectly reasonable physical interaction of, of parts. But what if Christianity falls out of favor? What if there is no God in the public imagination outside of nature? Well, then suddenly all of these merely physical objects, these entities that are supposed to be so rational, like atoms and forces that move between them, where do they get their powers? Where do they get their instructions to move in rational ways? If they don't get them from, from outside of nature, they must get them from somewhere. And suddenly they start to look just like pagan gods again. And this is why the old gods, who we thought we had kicked out the window, suddenly come in the back door once we lose our sense of the divine outside of nature. The divine re-enters into nature, and you start to get people talking about, oh, I don't know, Mother Nature and the sacrifices that she wants from us to make sure that we can continue to live in peace on her planet. You start to get people talking about the science as if it were something more than just a way of describing physical interactions, but an overarching governing religion, faith, that is supposed to direct our entire operation in the world, almost as if Cupid or the atom is turning into a god again.
That's why Dr. Fauci became our priest. I'm going to talk more about that next week, but I just find this to be a like kind of fascinating little history about how the pagan gods were banished from the world and then started to come back once the Christian god was kicked out of our picture of how things work. Okay, that's it from me this week. But let's, before we go, do the mailbag. Mailbag questions come to me at rejoiceevermore.substack.com or you can sign up for my weekly newsletter. I write once a week on Fridays. And if you would like to support me, I, I'd be very grateful. It's part of what helps me to do this show without as many ads as I would otherwise have to do to kind of support myself and keep things going. And please do sign up for that. You will get extras like my commentary on Paul's letter to the Romans. You'll get uh, an audiobook of Paradise Lost, some of which I read today, all sorts of fun stuff. And you will get to be in the mailbag. You can write in via email or you can... Uh, DM me on on the Substack app. And here's a DM from Evan. He says, Love the latest episode. Finding Young Heretics has sparked my love of reading again. That's terrific. I'm, I'm very glad. Been around since before the break. I do have a question in connection with the latest episode. Do you consider audiobooks as reading? Though I enjoy cracking into good books, I have always struggled reading multiple physical books, but I can really get and understand audiobooks. So, in your opinion, is this not the same? Thank you in advance for taking your time to read. Hope you answer one day. Okay, this is the day. The day has come. Uh, this is a really interesting question to me because I think it gets wrapped up with a lot of baggage that's probably unhelpful because reading itself has this enormous, shall we say, cachet. It, it sort of feels like something that makes you special. And it's very easy including for people like me who genuinely do love reading, to get into this mindset where reading sets you apart. And the more you read, the better a person you become morally. And there are certainly people out there who seem to think that they are better people because they are smarter people than their, their fellow man. And so then, if that's the case, you start to attach very high stakes to the question, what counts as reading? And then, of course, people try to defend their listening to audiobooks as reading because they don't want to be looked down upon and they want to be thought of as somebody that actually does read. And my feeling about this is uh, we should probably clear the decks of all that baggage to begin with before we have this conversation because no conversation is at its best when it's filled with these sort of moral stakes about whether you're a good person or not. I mean, moral conversations have to involve the, these moral questions. But but reading is, is slightly different. Reading is about forming yourself and your character um, and not about becoming better than than other people, except incidentally, right? Um, and so when, when, I, when I say what I'm about to say, it's not because I despise audiobooks or think they're worth less or you know, don't count in some essential way. But I think it's important to remember that different things are not the same. Things that are different are not the same, right? Men are not women. Uh, a house is, is not a piece of dirt. Like, these things that we say are the same sometimes are, are not the same, right? And that doesn't mean they're better or worse. Things can be different from one another without being morally better or worse. Um, but listening to an audiobook is simply a different experience than sitting and, and reading. There's a bunch of reasons why. First of all, you can do other stuff while you're listening to an audiobook. Um, you can get distracted more easily. And the book itself ceases to become the kind of exclusive object of your attention. And that does make physical reading harder because you have to sort of sit and find a quiet place and time to actually look at this object rather than to have somebody deliver it to you. There is more activity in reading with your eyes. You are more active when you read with your eyes than when you listen to something. It's somewhat more passive. Um, now, given the choice between reading nothing or listening to an audiobook, obviously you should listen to an audiobook. There's, there's lots of good and beneficial things about listening to to an audiobook. You, you ought to. Um, but, and, and by the way, I should say, I listen to certain things that I don't read in physical form. 
But I will say that I choose different things to listen to on Audible than I do to read in physical form. If I want to genuinely have ownership over a text, that is to incorporate it into my mind in its fullest sense, I'm going to get the, the physical object because there is simply something irreplaceable about the technology of sitting with this object, perhaps marking it up, maybe not, um, that doesn't get reproduced in an audiobook. You get other advantages, like you get the ability to incorporate more literature into your life. Maybe you process things better when you hear them. That's perfectly possible for some people. Um, but I think what we shouldn't do, probably, is use the word reading to describe listening to an audiobook. Um, because if you don't think that reading makes you a better person, as in, in some absolute sense of like more worthy of life or something, um, then you can weigh and compare the advantages that you get from reading something in physical form and listening to it on an audiobook. I think both are really good. I think for me, reading in physical form is essential, is kind of inescapable and does shape your character, even though it doesn't make you a better person in some abstract, absolute sense. I know plenty of very virtuous people who don't read at all, but I think they would be improved and shaped by reading books. And I think they would especially be improved by reading books physically. I would encourage those of you that don't do this to cultivate a practice, even if it hurts at first, of like 30 minutes a day with a, with a physical book, and then listen to your audiobooks too, right? There's no reason you can't do both. There's no reason that audiobooks can't help, especially with people that maybe don't connect as easily to, to physical books. Um, it's just that why do we feel the impulse to, to claim that these two things are the same? I suspect it's because we have this like weird association between reading and like personal excellence. And it's true, as I've argued before, that reading is actually good for you and does cultivate you and does make you better. Um, but that shades over really easily into, and therefore people who don't read are subhuman or don't deserve my time or attention or are like irrelevant to, to life or can't have good insights or whatever. Um, and it's defending against that insinuation, I think, that makes us want to claim audiobook reading as the same. It's not the same. They're, they're different, both worthwhile. Um, but I would say that if you really want to get a handle on something, cultivate the practice of, of reading in a physical sense. Because things that are different are not the same. Physical reading with a, a book using your eyes uh, is, is irreplaceable and doesn't count as the, the same thing, even though audiobooks are great too. Okay, I hope that answers your question. As always, let me tell you about one thing that I maked besides this podcast, and I'm going to tell you about my audiobook that I have created, having just said that audiobooks are not the same as physical books. Sometimes listening can give you a new side of things that you don't always get by reading something silently. And you should remember, of course, that reading silently was not always the way that people used to write texts or intend for them to be read. And poems especially benefit from being heard and, and read aloud. You have to pay attention to them, but they, they can be really good to listen to in an audiobook. And one poem that's great to listen to is Paradise Lost, which I am recording chapter by chapter, book by book, uh, on my Substack. If you become a paid subscriber, I will drop the link specially to that at rejoiceevermore.substack.com. And that's it from me. I will see you next week when we will talk more about pagan, modern paganism and the sort of return of pagan ideas in modern science. And as always, we will delve deeper into truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.